Hi friends, so we're gonna learn about nuclear power today. We're gonna start moving in the direction of talking about different kinds of alternative energies. Um, we've really exhausted fossil fuels. We've spent, I don't know, like half the year talking about climate change and uh, fossil fuel production. We learned all about electricity generation. Um, and so now we're gonna talk about different kinds of ways that we can use energy um, without fossil fuels. So we're gonna start with nuclear power, which has lots of promise and problems. Is my eyeliner different? It is. So we are going to go through the science of nuclear fission and how does that actually translate to electricity, which we should have a really strong understanding of. You just took your test. And um, then you are going to be assigned a power plant that is using an alternative energy like geothermal or solar panels or um, wind farm, whatever alternative energy. We don't have that many classes left. I would love to spend a ton of time really digging into each of these and learning them. We just don't have enough time unless you want to keep going through the summer, which I would, I don't know, I would do. What else, what else are we gonna do? You don't need to write everything down. You have access to the PowerPoint. Um, I do need you to just kinda take in some of the information and at the very least, some of the definitions you should be writing down to upload to Google Classroom so we can see that you are paying attention and uh, that you love science. So here we go, nuclear power, um, promise and problems. All right, so uh, nuclear energy. This should take you back to seventh grade, maybe even the beginning of the year when we talked about trophism and how energy is released in the process of breaking foods down. If you remember, the energy is stored in the bonds of molecules, and when they break, energy is released. Here's the thing. With nuclear energy, energy is held in the protons and the neutrons within the nucleus of the atom. And so um, it's a really, really, really strong bond, which means it can release a tremendous amount of energy. Um, and when the bonds are broken, when the protons and the neutrons, the nucleus is blown apart, it creates nuclear fission, which is the splitting of an, the atomic nuclei releases a tremendous amount of nuclear energy. Okay, there are many different elements that are um, fissionable, which means they can be broken apart. Um, not all of them cause a great big bomb with a radioactive um, mushroom cloud, and we'll talk about the difference between those two. Okay, here's nuclear fission in its most basic form. I'm going to splice in me drawing nuclear fission. Um, hopefully, I can get that video uploaded. It's being weird. Um, but here we have an incident neutron, which I like to think of as like a bullet. Um, you can actually isolate a neutron. We're talking like atomic level isolation of particles. You can isolate an incident neutron. You can shoot that incident neutron into the nucleus of some element that's fissionable, like uranium, plutonium, thorium, um, break it apart. And in the process of breaking it apart, you are essentially doing two things that go against everything we've talked about. You are destroying matter and you are creating energy. Does that sound like something that maybe doesn't quite jive with some of the laws that we've learned this year? That's because it doesn't, it doesn't fit in with the laws of thermodynamics. Um, so uh, the fissionable nucleus is destroyed, breaks apart. The smaller pieces of the nucleus can then also be split apart. It releases neutrons and it releases a tremendous amount of energy in the form of radiation and heat. You get fissionable fission products that are then themselves fissionable. They can break apart. They're radioactive uh, um, often. If this fission process continues on and keeps breaking apart the nucleus of um, the element that you are um, bombarding with uh, neutrons, 
then it's going to cause a chain reaction. And the chain reaction is what we mostly think of when we think of a nuclear explosion. The chain reaction just continues on and on until that material is spent. That fuel source is all used up. It's all blown apart. You can't use it anymore. Um, and so a nuclear fission reaction that causes this chain reaction really can go two ways. One, it can kind of be slowed down and controlled, which is how we uh, utilize it for electrical energy generation. And we'll, I'll show you how that works in a minute. Or it makes a bomb. It explodes and it creates a giant mushroom cloud. Like, Okay, here is another image using uranium. Um, so you're essentially converting mass and some physical element. Here's my uranium. I wish I had uranium. I really want to order uranium on Amazon because you can buy it. Um, but the reviews are super mixed, and I'm going to post the reviews. Um, some people are like, ah, this uranium was great. It has a Geiger counter. Um, they have Geiger, I don't know why they have Geiger counters, but people are, say like, oh, this uranium is great. And then other people are like, what a ripoff. It's just a rock. So I, I might order one. I don't know. Um, so you have some like actual physical mass that is converted into energy here. So it involves the release of um, energy from splitting atoms of the uranium. The mass of the product is less than the starting mass. The lost mass is converted to energy. So it is going against all of the laws that we've talked about. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. Mass cannot be created or destroyed, except that it can, which is E equals MC squared. Mass is converted into energy. Lost mass destroyed is converted into new created energy. Amazing. Okay, radioactivity. Um, a radioactive material, you should remember maybe from seventh grade, some of you maybe did ura uranium or plutonium or carbon even. Um, and you should think back to when you talked about how elements can have isotopes. So carbon, super stable, carbon 12. Um, we build our bodies, everything out of it, graphite, everything. Carbon 14 is an isotope. So um, if you remember that carbon-14 as an isotope has a different number of neutrons than carbon-12, and so it's inherently less stable. So um, when we are um, looking at different isotopes and we say, okay, uranium typically has, let's see, I have uh, 92 protons and 146 neutrons but it has other isotopes that make it more unstable. So a radioactive atom, so that's one of the isotopes of some element, is perfect for nuclear fission because it holds a large amount of energy and it's inherently unstable, which means you can break it apart, okay? So uranium we use in electrical power generation for a bunch of reasons. One, it's super heavy, it's naturally occurring element. You can mine it right out of the ground. You can get it, at, it's stored in Earth's crust. Um, and it has 16 different isotopes. And two of the main ones are readily accessible. So there is uranium-238 and uranium-235. So let's take a look at that. Most of the uranium 99.3% of uranium is uranium-238. Inherently stable, well, it's pretty stable. Um, 92 protons, 146 neutrons. Uranium-235, which is a smaller, really, really, really small percent, is much more unstable. And that's because it has an uneven number of neutrons um, with 143. So, both are fissionable, which means you can break it apart. So you can bombard it with a neutron and the nucleus will expand, explode, break apart and release heat and energy. The uranium-235, however, will create a chain reaction, which means that it's fissile, okay? So I want you to write down, both are fissionable, they can break apart 
only uranium-235 is fissile, which means it can cause a chain reaction, a continued release of heat and energy until that fuel is completely spent. So in order to get uranium that we can use for electrical power generation, you actually have to mine it out of the ground and you have to spin it in a centrifuge to get a higher concentration of the uranium-235. It's heavier. So when you put something in a centrifuge and you spin it, what happens? You can separate out the different weight weighted elements. Um, so we call that enriched uranium ore. Okay, so it needs to be enriched to raise uranium-235 to like 3 to 5% that we use. And now we get fuel. And the fuel is mostly uranium-238, but it is a higher percentage of um, uranium-235 which means that it is um, more radioactive, it is less stable, it can cause a chain reaction if it were allowed to uh, release, if it were allowed to continue the chain reaction. So that's what we use in our power plants, and I'll show you how that works. But in um, a bomb, in a weapon, they actually enrich the uranium to like 90%. Um, so there's all these laws and regulations around who can even own what country, when I say who, I mean what country, can even own a centrifuge machine that can enrich the uranium or the plutonium. Because if you can make 3%, 5% uranium, enriched uranium ore, what? you could make 90% enriched uranium ore and you could be making covert weapons. Um, so who can even buy which isotopes or who can access the mines for uranium is there's is highly regulated. Um, so all of that is uh, like wrapped up in like political unrest of nuclear weaponry. Um, there was a um, Iran, the big Iran nuclear deal. Um, I'm just reading this, um, that Clinton helped negotiate under Obama. And the gist of that deal was that Iran had to turn over its machines for the enriching process um, in hopes that they would be unable to develop them for nuclear weapons. So they were allowed to then purchase uranium, but they had to get rid of like two thirds of their enriching machines, um, their facilities that they could um, turn the uranium into uh, fissile ore. So lots of lots going on there. Okay, let's go to, I want to show you the nuclear power plant. Okay, here it is, nuclear power plant. This is amazing to me because we are using this incredible chemical reaction, this like amazing technology that was like only theorized in the early part of the um, 1900s. And by like 1944, we were testing bombs. And by 1946, we were dropping bombs on cities. And then in the 1950s, scientists were like, what? We, we can use this for electricity, free electricity for everybody. This is going to be an amazing technology. It's going to change the world. Um, that was called the atomic age, where everyone's imagination kind of went wild. And um, you know, we we're going to power our cars with nuclear power, atomic molecules, uh, models like infiltrated all of society. They were used in design and advertising and toys. And it was just going to be the wave of the peaceful future. We're not using it for bombs anymore. We're using it for electricity. And there were tremendous amounts of nuclear engineers that were designing ways that we could change this power plant um, design to make it work for us. So we could no longer be just burning coal or burning oil um, and we could use nuclear power. We could somehow harness nuclear power. Here's the thing. Theoretically, it there were lots and lots of ways to do it. Um, but it proved to be really difficult and really expensive. And there was not quite the understanding. Um, there was not quite the understanding that coal and fossil fuels were finite. 
or that they were really bad for the environment. And so um, it kind of got dropped and people kind of got burnt out on the idea of making nuclear power plants. And so the technology uh, kind of got put on pause. There are other things that the United States were worried about, like getting people on the moon and all of that. So it wasn't until the 1970s that there was um, the war in the Middle East and that caused oil prices to rise and people were worried we wouldn't have access to oil around the world. And so there was a craze, like a vast uh, craze to get nuclear power plants up and running. And what they did in the 70s was rely on technology that was theorized in the 50s, that was originating from the 40s, uh, weaponry technology. And they picked the cheapest one, not the most efficient, not the most technologically advanced, just not even the best one. They picked the cheapest and the fastest. And that was this light water power plant design where you essentially take fuel rods of uranium and you envelop it with water. And have you ever tried to run in water? It slows you down, right? Well, the idea was if you put a nuclear reaction in water, it will slow down the neutrons and um, the water can like capture the heat. So they put it, put the, they say, okay, well, let's build a nuclear reactor uh, filled with water, um, a coolant and um, it's high pressure water. And also let's um, throw some graphite rods in there to like absorb the incident neutrons that are, um, not the incident neutrons, but the uh, fission neutrons that are released in the process of um, fission starting. So they essentially allow the fission reaction to begin and then they put control rods in to stop it or slow it down. So fission, 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 slow it down. Fission, 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 slow it down. So it never reaches a chain reaction point um, because of the coolant and because of the control rods that are moderating how many of the excess neutrons can be released. Because if you throw neutrons, incident neutrons at um, graphite, it doesn't break apart because it is highly, highly stable, pure carbon, and it's not going to um, cause a chain reaction or even release energy. So that's like the most basic design. And if you look at this here, nuclear reactor, we have our fuel rods, which are just little stacked pellets of enriched uranium ore. They're really tiny. They're like the size of pencil erasers. And they are all stacked up. And um, they, in between them, they put graphite rods inside water. That water is then moved through a coil inside a boiler. Does this sound familiar? Inside a boiler that generates steam, kinetic energy, which then uh, makes gears move right this is the like turbine the steam turbine that we were talking about it makes those turbines move which is mechanical energy which then starts to spin an electric um a copper wire inside magnetic field which is generating electricity so it is this steam turbine technology from the 1800s using uh, light water power a nuclear power plant design from the 50s built in the 70s and the early 80s and those are the power plants we are still using today we have not really come up with any new technology for power plants um, since this time um, so here's some fun facts 10% uh, of the world's energy is nuclear power. We have 439 nuclear power plants in the world. 95% um, of them are 25 years old or older and are using the light water reactor design. So what do we do? Do we try to come up with new nuclear engineering, more efficient nuclear engineering? Do we 
think of this as the promise of the future and invest in it. Um, but what are the what are the cons to it? What are the problems to it? Um, and you can see this containment structure is made out of really thick concrete. It's supposed to be plane proof, earthquake proof, tsunami proof. It's not. And um, there have been some incidents where the nuclear reactor has melted down. In 1979, Three Mile Island in PA, 1986, Chernobyl, um, and in 2011, Fukushima. So um, of the seven massive nuclear incidents that have occurred, um, there have been at least four I think I have, yeah, four that have released long-term radioactivity in the soil and the atmosphere, and it stays for decades because that's how radioactivity works. It releases um, radioactive waves over decades because of the half-life of the uranium or the plutonium. So lots and lots going on there. That's not even addressing the idea of um, using the same technology for weaponry, we go. Um, <laughs> problems with nuclear power, we've, we've outlined nuclear disasters and we've also outlined um, weaponry. So there is quite a lot of argument against using nuclear power. Um, but do we need to have some positive associations such as um, nuclear power energy related deaths so that is including any of the like big disasters that we've had um is still less than the deaths related to coal or oil um in terms of energy collection so the death per fuel rates are much lower in uh nuclear power and uranium mining. It is a clean energy. It does not release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. It runs long-term. Is it a solution to our energy problems? That we don't know. Um, and then of course, public opinion about the negative associations is, you know, three-eyed fish and um, nuclear disaster and children hiding under their desks for nuclear raids. Um, and what do we do with the waste? So that is a problem. What do we do with the waste? When the fuel is spent, it's not all gone. Um, and right now it's kind of being held in the basements of some of the nuclear reactors and there's proposals to bury it in mountains. Um, there's a possibility to like recombine it and turn it into weapons. So then it's like Germany has tons and tons of this, um, like recombined plutonium and it's just hanging out. What, what are they doing with it? We don't really know. Um, here's nuclear construction permits and the year of operation. And then here is the three mile Island incident in Pennsylvania, which was caused a nuclear meltdown, but not a massive one. Like they, there was in Chernobyl was 1986. And so nuclear power production almost halted um, in the United States because construction permits were no longer issued. So we're still using nuclear power, just really old buildings. So that's, we're gonna stop here. And we are going to um, watch a TED talk on a kid who built a nuclear reactor in his garage, which is, I don't, I don't know how I'd feel about that if I was his mom. I go, what are you doing in there, honey? That does, it seems suspect. Um, but he's really passionate about it, truly feels that nuclear power is the um, wave of the future. Um, so you're going to watch that and reflect on that. And then we will move on to our uh, conversations about all the, all the other alternative energies.